in the Lord. And so it talks about uh, having justification by faith and getting born again by grace and then uh, being sanctified by grace. And then it talks about that we're free from the law and that we're filled with the Holy Spirit and that we have, a, have gifts and callings of God upon our life. And so these are all vertical between you and the Father. But you know what? Now we're going to get to sections of Scripture where we're going to go horizontal and so we're going to find out that after you got saved, God did not take you to heaven. You didn't get a private rapture, but God left you here. Why? Because God's called you to be a billboard for Jesus here today and serve other people and minister to other people. And we're going to find out that it's a lot easier to, to kind of deal with just your relationship with God. God's pretty easy to get along with. And so, you know, when you go into the presence of God, God doesn't pick you apart and say, well, you need to, you know what, he's gracious to us. And every once in a while, we may have a controversy with the Lord where we're just not wanting to do what he wants to do. But usually it's pretty easy to have that relationship with the Father. Where it's difficult is dealing with people. And so I think dealing with people is like dancing with porcupines. <laughs> it gets sticky. And so, you know, ministry is all about people. And so raise your hand if you're called to be a minister. And so every hand ought to be going up because every saint's called a minister. I'm to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. You're the saints to do the work of the ministry. So every one of you called with ministry. And so, you know what? Ministry would be so easy if there wasn't people. And <laughs> Proverbs talks about where there's no oxen, the stall is clean. Think on these things. But much strength comes by way of the ox. And so when you have more people, you have problems. But you know what? That's a blessing because people are getting set free. And you're ministering to one another. And we found out in this chapter that each one of us have a gift. And we're to minister it to one another. And we're to be a living sacrifice. And it's so easy just to get wrapped up into ourselves, be comfortable in our vertical relationship with God. Get out of our comfort zone, though, and serve someone else with our gift. And when we do that, the flesh doesn't like to get out of your comfort zone. The flesh screams, no! And you say, yes, flesh, we're going to... We're going to use our prophetic gift. We're going to use our ministry gift. We're going to use our teaching gift. We're going to, we're going to go out and we're going to get out of ourself. And we're going to do that. And when we do that, our flesh hits the fire. Sizzle, 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 sizzle. <laughs> Praise God. You've gotten that. And so we're called a living sacrifice. And so here it's going to talk about how to practically be a living sacrifice in dealing with people. Because it's not always easy dealing with people. And so here it says, distributing to the needs of the saints. Look at that word distributing. It's where we get the Greek word koinonia, which means a partnering or a sharing, uh, uh, to share in common with. And so we're to distribute the, uh, to the needs of the who? To the saints. And guess who that is? That's you. If you're born again, you're a saint. And you need to realize that. You need to practice that, that you're a saint. So I want you to introduce yourself and say, I'm saint and give your first name. Go ahead. Don't be scared. You're a saint. You don't have to wait till you die and get voted on to be a saint. You're born again a saint. And so that's who you are. And so we should be busy about first meeting the needs of the saints. Have you ever heard charity begins at home? And so oftentimes we're helping other people outside. We're, we're busy about helping all these other people, but the people of our own house that we're not helping. And so really we should first check at home and then export it. And so we, we should do that. Galatians 6.10 says... Galatians 6.10 says, we are to do good to all men, but especially to those of the household of faith. And raise your hand, if you're a believer, you're the household of faith. So we should be looking for the needs first among Christians and then outside. Next it says, we are to be given to hospitality. And so Aaron loved this verse. But it says, given to hospitality. Look at that word hospitality. It's a Greek word. It's a compound word that means to be fond of strangers. So raise your hand if you're strange. I mean, you're a stranger. <laughs> what does that mean? It means someone not like you. You know what? Not everybody's like you. Praise the Lord. Because you're precious, but we, we, we don't need a lot of it. We need you to be who you're called to be. And I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to your neighbor. So praise yeah. God. Me and you like this. Let's stay in here. And so, you know what? Sometimes we just want to hang around people who are just like us with our background, our culture. But you know what? There's a lot of cultures. Don't hang around ungodly people. 
but there's a lot of good cultures. There's different cultures, different, different uh, way personalities are. So we should be fond of meeting people not like us. That's the way Christ is, so be open to that. But what does this verse not say? This verse is not telling you that you need to find someone that's on the homeless on the street and bring him into your house. I say, you know what, I'm going to be given to hospitality, and so I'm going to bring a brand new, I'm bring a stranger into my house, into my home. And so, you know what, that is not what, what you're called to do. Well, they did it in the early church. Well, no, they didn't. You know what they did in the early church? Yes, they housed strangers, but they came with, record, with uh, letters of recommendation. We find that throughout the New Testament, letters of recommendation. So you didn't just let anybody into your house, especially if you have a family with kids. You're not going to bring just someone you don't know into your house. That's not smart. And so, so that's not what it's saying. It's saying just be fond, be open to meet people and be with people that are not just like you. And so, again, given to hospitality. Look at verse 14. It says, bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. And so we're going to get more difficult here. It says, bless those that persecute you. Bless and do not curse them. And so I don't know about you, what's the first reaction when someone curses you? Is it to reach in your pocket and say, oh, bless you, Jesus <laughs> name. No, that's not the, but your first tendency is to, to strike back or to curse back or to do bad back. But you know what? We are to bless those that persecute us and bless and do not curse. This is really a carryover from the Sermon on the Mount. I want you to look at the Matthew 5.44. This is from the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus Matthew 5, look at verse 44, it says, Jesus said, but I say to you, love your enemies, bless those that curse you, do good to those who hate you, pray for those who spitefully use you and persecute you. In the Sermon of the Mount, he's speaking to people that are not born again. These are Jews under the law, before Jesus died, they're not saved, and so they think they can keep the law. He says, oh, you think you can keep the law? Well, let me raise the bar of the law even higher. And so the law really dealt with your actions, but he says, I'm going to deal with your heart right now. And so, you know, he says, the law says don't kill anybody. Well, you know, well I can white knuckle it and not kill you. But he says, but don't even hate someone in your heart. Or you've done it in your heart. Gulp. It's like I can not kill someone outwardly, but I don't know how to stop this feeling on the inside. And he says, you know what, if, you know, don't commit, the law says don't commit adultery. He said, well, I might white-knuckle it and not be able to commit adultery, but he says, don't even lust in your heart. Gulp. What am I going to do about that? And so then he says, you know what, if your, sin, if, your, if your eye offends you or your foot offends you, cut them off. And if everybody did that, we have an amputee ward. <laughs> you know? And so God didn't call it. But then he just raises the bar at the very end. He says, hey, guys, if you didn't get what I'm saying, be perfect as your Father in heaven's perfect. Gulp. And the, so really what the Sermon on the Mount was is to drive them to their knees and say, God, we can't do that. We don't have, we can deal with the outward, but I can't deal with my heart. And God says, bingo, you have the wrong heart. You need a heart transplant. And so when you got saved, you got a heart transplant. The heart of a pig got taken out of you and the heart of a sheep got put in. Bad. <laughs> so you couldn't do that unless you're, unless you're saved. Do I need to do a sheep a, a cheat test? Go back. You couldn't do that. That's proof. You couldn't do that if you were still unsaved. And so God will give you a heart transplant. So, well, that's Sermon on the Mount. That's old tea. That's before Jesus died. Throw it away. We don't need that. Well, G, Paul brings it over into the New Covenant to Christians, to born again people that have the power of God, that have the nature of God, the Holy Spirit, the power of God, and you can do it through the power of the Holy Spirit. So when someone persecutes you, someone curses you, you have the ability and the power of God to bless them. And so that's what we're called to do. And so guess what? God has placed curses, every curse that you deserved on Jesus, and God has no curses for you today. Is that good news? That when you do something against God, and when you offend him or you do something against him, guess what? He's not cursing you today. Guess what he gives you instead? Blessing. He blesses you. And so he does that for you. But guess what you get to do? Receive the blessing. But then you get to turn around and do it to someone else. When someone else persecutes you or does something wrong, then you, instead of cursing, you can release blessing over them. Well, pastor, that, I can't, that's not something I can do. Not in your flesh. Have you ever tried to love someone in your flesh? 
and all you want to do is slap them? Well, you, you're trying to do it in the flesh. No, you can do it by the power of the Holy Spirit. So how do you tap into that? It's just a knit you can't do it in the natural. Lord, I don't have that in the natural, but I have you in my spirit. And your love's been poured out, and so I'm going to rely on your grace. So I'm asking for your love to come online here, your grace and empowerment to come in line. I receive it by faith right now. I believe I have that grace. And all of a sudden, he gives you that supernatural power, that, 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 that sense of of love that you can minister to someone and it comes out of your heart and it's true and it's not fake. And so you can do that today. Tell someone you can do it. Hallelujah. Look at verse 15. Here's some other things that you can't do in the natural in your flesh, but you can in the spirit. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. You know, oftentimes it's easier to rejoice with someone that's rejoicing unless they just got what you've been praying for. <laughs> Hallelujah. <laughs> you ever had that where you're believing for that, that thing and they got it? Mm, I'm rejoicing with you. But you can do that. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those that weep. You can't do that in the natural, but you can in the spirit. Well, I don't believe I'm ever supposed to be sad. Hallelujah. I'm a Christian and I'm never to weep. Well, then, you, then, you're, then you're better than Jesus. Because Jesus would never ask from you that he doesn't do it himself. It says, weep with those who weep. You remember in John chapter 11, verse 35? This is my, one of my favorite Bible verses because I remember it so much because I, when, I went to, when I went to Bible school or, or a children's church, you had to memorize Bible verses. And I picked this one right off the bat. John eleven thirty five. 35, Jesus wept. <laughs> Jesus. And so I, Jesus wept. But, but this whole story was, is that, you know, he's, he tells the disciples, we're, we're going to go. And, and you know, we heard Lazarus, you know, needed help and he was sick. And so he told the disciples, we're going to go, we're going to go wake up Lazarus. Lazarus is sleeping. And the disciples said, well, if he's sleeping, he'll probably get, they'll get, probably get better. He says, no, guys, he's dead. We're going to go and we're going to raise him from the dead. So they go over there, and then Martha comes out. Oh, if only you were here. Mark, Mary comes Oh, if only you were here. And so Jesus said, well, show me where you laid him. He didn't know. He didn't operate in omniscience all the time. So they took him, showed him where it was, and all around the grave, there, everybody was around weeping, and they were sorrowing, and they were weeping. And it says Jesus saw them weeping, and he wept. Now, I've heard uh, someone say one time, he says, you know what, that Jesus looked at all those people crying because Lazarus died, and he was so upset because of their unbelief that he cried because of their unbelief. <laughs> no, he's moved with our, the, what moves us. Even though he was seconds away from raising him from the dead. He came knowing he would raise him from the dead. But what moves you moves him. That's our Jesus. It says, weep with those who weep. Verse 16. Be of the same mind towards one another. Oh, it's getting harder now. It just gets worse from here. Be of the same mind towards one another. Uh-oh, does that mean that we need to agree on every point of doctrine with every other believer? Good, good, have fun with that one. I think eternity is what we need just to straighten us all out. You know? And so, you know, we, we, none of us have perfect theology. And so I haven't met anybody that would be daring enough to say every point of doctrine, big, small, Genesis to Revelation, I have perfect doctrine in every point. Now, don't raise your hand if that's you. We'd have to pray for you. But no one would really say, well, I, I have perfect doctrine. But if you ask any point, well, what about that? And what about that point? And what about, well, no, that's not one of them that's wrong. Well, that's not one of them that's wrong. And so, but really we have to realize that we have blind spots. We don't know what we don't know. We don't see what we see. And so this isn't talking about being the same in everything that we think. What is this talking about? It's talking about having the same mind that Jesus had. Look in Philippians chapter 2, look at verse 5. We're going to find out what mind Jesus had. 
and we have the same mind. Philippians 2, look at verse 5. It says, let this mind, say mind, mind, be in you which was also in Christ Jesus. Paul, what mind did, was in Christ Jesus? Look at the next verse. Who being in the form of God, did not consider it robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, taking the form of a bondservant and coming in the likeness of men. What was the mindset of the Lord Jesus Christ when he came? A mindset of a servant. And every one of you can have the same mind and do have the same mind in your born again spirit. But so you but you got to get out of your natural thinking and get into the spirit. Tell someone, are you out of your mind? <laughs> you need to be. Get into the mind of Christ. What's that practically? What does that mean? That you're a servant. Well, practically, pastor, what does that mean? Well, what does it mean? It means don't look for what people will do for you. Look what you can do for people. John F. Kennedy for Christians. Ask not what you can do, what others can do for you. Ask what you can do for people. That's a whole paradigm shift of being a servant. And so what does it really mean, the golden rule? What you would have people do to you, you do for them. Don't wait for them to do that to you. You do it for them, and that's becoming a servant. And you can have the same mind. If every, what would happen if every one of us had that mindset? Ooh, heaven on earth. You know, I believe that's the way it is in heaven. Just a kingdom of servants in heaven. And so that's what we're called to do. Next of all, it says, don't set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. So it says, don't, don't make your aspiration to get to this high lofty position where everybody can see you, everybody knows your name, that, that you're, you're just those fancy people ooh and all over, and so they say your name all the time. Don't seek those things. He may put you there, but don't seek those things. Don't even put it in your mind. Don't even think about trying to do that. You just love Jesus and love people and let God take care of your sphere of influence. But what should you do? Associate with the humble. What's that mean? This means that you're to associate with people that hold seemingly rabbit ears. Seemingly mundane positions and do mundane tasks. You know, I believe if Jesus came to a mega church and preached after lunch instead of hanging out with the big wigs and the the doodads and everything else I believe he would have lunch with the with the uh, housekeeping staff with the maintenance crew he would hang out with them and feel so comfortable with them and so if you're called to be a leader or be a pastor you need to be comfortable not just when the guest speaker comes in but just being knowing everybody and realizing that we're all equal in value and worth and so don't, I always hate it when the Lord says, I want you to use a personal example from your life. I'm like, Jesus, you really? <laughs> Just like Moses, right? When he's writing scripture and God says, Moses, I want you to write, you're the most humble person on the earth. <laughs> really? Well, you know I'm the eye rolls I'm going to get from Marion and Aaron over that. <laughs> So he said, okay, so I wrote it. And so the Lord said, I want you to give some exa a, a example from your life on this. And so I've never told anybody, but because the Lord's directed me to do it. Uh, up at Karis, it was uh, not recently, maybe a year or two ago, uh, it just put on my heart that I was to take out the entire um, custodial and maintenance team to lunch and pay for it myself. So I took them out to a Mexican restaurant, just had to just, just show, no, well, I'm a big guy. No, no, just say, you know what, you're, you are so valuable. Not just what you do, but who you are. And, just been, and then a few weeks later, I took the IT department out to lunch and just said, and, because these are the people in the background and stuff like that. But you know what, it's, it's because they're valuable. Amen. They're just as valuable as you are. And so I love this verse. In Philippians 2.25, Paul had this mindset in the ministry. I mean, he had full of this revelation, but you know what? He always put relationship first right, based on uh, his, his knowledge of God. So Philippians 2.25 says, Yet I consider it necessary to send you Epaphroditus, my brother. Say, my brother. My brother. Fellow, worker, fellow worker. Fellow soldier. Fellow soldier. What order did he put it in? Brother. brother. See, 
if, it, if he put it just on the soldier, there's always rank and file. There's submission authority, generals, and all the way down, and there's, and there's not equality there in the military. How about in the workforce? There's bosses and directors and coordinators and managers and just the ones that do the basic work. And so there's all kinds of, but you know, instead of doing that, he focused on brother. And when he talked on brother, you put it who we are in Christ and put us all on the equal ground, equally valuable, equally loved, equally righteous, equally important. And so that's how we should have a mindset to look at everybody around us. And so guess what? Don't expect to sit on the front row. Jeremy. No, no, no. Someone needs to sit on the front row, but don't expect it. Well, bless God, you expect it. Now, let me say something to you. This front row is open to any of you. Well, I wouldn't sit on the front row. I'm sure that's for the big wigs. And the... No, you're all big wigs. You're all super dupers. In him, in yourself, you're not. Well, don't offend me, Pastor. Well, you need to be offended because in the flesh, Paul says, according to the natural, I'm nothing. But in him, I'm the righteous of God in Christ Jesus. So this front row is open. Now, don't all try to sit here because it would be pretty crowded. <laughs> Luke 14, 7 says, So Jesus told a parable to those who were invited when he noted how they chose the best places, saying to them, When you're invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down at the best place, lest one more honorable than you be invited by him. And he who invited you, he will come and say to you, give place to this man, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you're invited, go sit down in the lowest place, so that when he who's invited you comes and says, friend, go up higher, then you have glory in the presence of those who sit at the table with you, for whoever exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. All right, next verse, 17. It gets harder from here. Repay no one evil for evil, have regard for good things in the sight of all men. And so when someone does evil to you, what's the natural tendency of the flesh to do? Well, I'm repaying you. You did that to me. You owe me. I'm going to repay you for what you've got. And so that's really what the Old Testament law was about. Tooth, tooth for tooth. Eye for an eye. You break my tooth, I'm breaking your tooth. You know, we're going to get even. And that's where Old Testament prayers come. Break their teeth. In Jesus' name. <laughs> Lord, open up the earth and swallow them into hell alive. In Jesus' name. <laughs> Tell someone, get out of the OT. <laughs> Repay no one evil for evil. And so that's, that's like the, immediately when they do something to you, you want to do it back to them. You know, the, the first thing when someone does something against you, that first probably three or four things you want to do is not from God. <laughs> right when, they, when you get that text, don't text back. Oh, you get that email. Well, I have some, I have brilliant inspiration. I'm going to write you back in caps. <laughs> and then they have brilliant inspiration back at you. Well, how dare you? And then it just escalates. No, no, you got to wait and, and let the Lord take care of it and respond out of the Spirit. Repay no one for evil for evil. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. Have regard for good things in the sight of all men. Well, what, what does that mean? It's right there connected to repay no evil for evil. What's it trying to say here is that when you give someone a piece of your mind, I would rather, I, probably not, you need to keep all you got. Instead of you blowing up or whatever, you need to pay attention that people are watching you. How often when you get all upset, you forget about everybody else but me. And you blow up and you don't see all the people watching you and say, oh, I thought that was pa that's Pastor Rick up at Karen's. Getting angry in the Walmart line. But I'm not thinking about that at the moment. My witness before other people. People are watching. You're an example. Are you a good one or a bad one? Because we're an example. Verse 18 says, If it's possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably with all men. I am so thankful the Lord added the phrase, if it's possible. <laughs> Thank you. 
Because with some people, it's impossible because they refuse, no matter what you do, they refuse to be at peace with you. So what do you do when that happens? Love them at a distance. I'm hallelujah. Some people just got to love at a distance. Sit on the other side of the congregation. But it says, if it's possible, as much as it depends on you, live peaceably. But you know what? Most of the time, there is something that you can do to keep peace in a relationship. And so, so, so this means to not let a separation be caused by anything that came from you or from your side. You can control you, no one else. And so often when we're dealing with someone else, we're focusing on them. Look what they did. Look at what they said. And I've had so many I've had marriage counseling where we had marriage before we even got down with both of them together because I won't have marriage counseling with one person. It takes two. And, but you would hear the story. The lady would say, oh, he's Satan incarnate. <laughs> and then you talk to her. Oh, you know, and you talk to him. It's oh, she's Jezebel. <laughs> she never died. She's alive. And so you have to get them together and see the truth here. But you, they always talk about what they did. You ever hear someone tell one side of the story? They, they said, well, this other person said, nya, 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 nya. and I said this. And they said, nya, 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 nya. and I said like this. <laughs> Almost all separations involve more than just one party. You need, instead of focusing on the other person, you need to gulp. Focus on you. Ask the Holy Spirit, is there something in me that I need to work on? <gasps> Perchance. <laughs> because you're blind. We all have blind spots. We don't see what we don't see. We don't know what we don't know. We don't see how we come off. Our tone, our actions, how... And, and you've never even seen your own face. You've seen some of it. But you're <laughs> blind to certain things about yourself. So, Holy Spirit, is there something I need to work on? And so, I, you know, me and Joanne will have these times of intense fellowship. And I would separate myself and go in my prayer closet and say, Lord, this woman thou hast given. I get, I get King James. Thou hast given me. And the Lord says, I don't want to talk about Joanne. Oh, well, you want to talk about my parents, how I grew up in a bad home? No, no, no. I want to talk about you. Me? How I was wronged and never know how you were wrong. Oh. How you acted like a jerk. Oh. Well, I want you to go admit it. So I go to Joanne, I'm sorry. The Lord said I acted like a jerk. She says, that bears witness with me. <laughs> but focus on yourself. Things go much quicker quicker because you can only really handle and control yourself not someone else verse 19 beloved do not avenge yourselves but rather give place to wrath for it is written vengeance is mine I will repay says the Lord oh here's a verse get him Jesus get him this verse says well if I don't get him the Lord will get him well no you're misunderstanding something because guess what the Lord has never gotten you So if he hadn't gotten you, that means that he's not out getting other people. So you must not misunderstand what this verse is talking about. And so we're going to have a paradigm shift of what this verse is talking about today. So this verse says, beloved, do not avenge yourself. In the new covenant, God always gives you a resource to be able to obey him from. Here we're not to, we're not to avenge ourselves, but give place, place to the wrath. Well, how do we do that? By the first word of the verse, beloved. Beloved. You know what? When you realize how much God loves you, it really doesn't matter what other people think of you. How dare they say that about me? Well, it's because you care about what they think. When you realize God is the only one at the end of the day has a means anything really of any eternal value. But what does God say? And he calls you beloved. You know how you know how to be God's beloved? Be loved. Be loved. And just focus on how much he loves you. In the midst of that strife you're having, and you, you feel like you've been wronged and people have done you wrong, just focus on God's love for you. God loves you. And so, beloved, do not avenge yourselves, 
but give place to wrath. Um, so actually that word avenge means to give out justice. Well, someone's done injustice to me, and so I'm going to mete out justice to them. Don't do that. It says, but rather give place to wrath. The Greek says this, make room for the wrath. In the Greek, it's the wrath. It's specific. It says, make room for the wrath. Let me ask you a question. When and where did God pour his wrath out upon mankind? On the cross of the Lord Jesus Christ. And most of us in this room have made room for that wrath to include our sins. And we said, thank you, Jesus, that you don't judge my sins and judge me for my sins, but you judge Jesus for my sin. And you've made room for that wrath so that you could receive forgiveness for that sin. Pray, say, praise the God, I'm not judged for my sins. You've made room for that, but guess what? You need to expand a little bit further, make a little bit more room, because guess what? He didn't judge you for your sins, but he also is not judging the other person for their sins against you. Because at the same place, Jesus died for their sins too. So you need to make room for the wrath. And you need to believe that God's not only forgiven you, but he's forgiven them too. And says, give place to the wrath, for it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay. Get him, Jesus! Pay him back! Well, wait a minute. Hold on a second. Your theology has to fit with you, and if it fits for you, it's going to fit for everybody. Is the Lord repaying you for your sins? Well, he's going to wait to heaven. He'll get them then. No, he's not going to get them then. He's not going to get you then. He's not getting them then. What's this verse saying that says, vengeance is mine? Vengeance is the word justice. Justice is mine. I will repay. So this is not talking about the Lord will repay them. The Lord will repay you for the injustice done to you. Amen. The Lord will pay you back. If you won't put justice in, oh, I'm going to make them pay. I'm going to do this. Because when you insert yourself into that, that's when you make it a mess of it. That's when you muddy the water. Because you're going to have it wrong. You're going to have it twisted. It'll be perverted justice. But God has perfect justice. And he knows how to pay you back in interest. He knows how to bless you so much that you're better on the other side if it never happened. You're be as, you know, because it happened, you're better off than if it never happened. And so the Lord says, justice is mine. I will repay He's not out repaying people for their sins, but he will pay you back. Trust him today because he knows how to take what is horrible and make something beautiful out of it. And he knows how to take care of you far better than you can take care of yourself. Verse 20. Therefore, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, give him a drink. And so I was looking at this verse today and it, my, my, my mind thought back is like there's a number of times where people in the congregation will make me food and bring me food. And I'm like, uh, am I an enemy? So, so praise God. If you have something odd, don't make me food. Just tell me, hey, Rick, I have a problem with you. So I know that all food's from your love. <laughs> Thank you. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him a drink. For in so doing, you will heap coals of fire on his head. Get him, Jesus! Pour out fire on your head. Well, is he pouring fire out on your head? So what's he talking about? Coals of fire is a euphemism, a, a, a metaphor for the pain of your conscience and repentance. You know, when, 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 uh, when you've done wrong towards the Lord, and he blesses you anyway, guess what? You're like, oh, it melts you. You're like, but before you do that, it's kind of painful. Oh, I was wrong. You know, a wonderful verse, Romans 2, 4. If you don't despise the riches of his goodness and forbearance and longsuffering, not knowing that the goodness of God leads you to repentance. When, God, when you don't deserve it and God's good to you, it leads you to repentance. At first, it's, that's not very, that's kind of like, oh, kind of painful. I was wrong. But you know what? It turns to repentance. To it. It's a good thing. And so 
what should you do? You should do good to those that use, misuse you. And guess what? When you do that, they go tilt, tilt, tilt. I don't understand how that is. And the Lord can start working in their conscience. And they can turn them around. And they will repent. Let's go to verse 21 in here. Do not be overcome by evil, but overcome evil with good. And the temptation is, is when something's evil's done to me, I'm going to overcome it with, with another evil. But evil's darkness and goodness is light. So how do you overcome darkness? Well, I'm going to overcome it with more dark. I'm going to make it darker. You don't overcome darkness with darkness. You overcome darkness with what? Flip the switch. Darkness is walking in the flesh and the, and the light's walking in the spirit. Again, the first three or four options that comes to you right after someone does to you is from the flesh. So you need to wait and be able to tap into the Holy Spirit, turn the light on, and you'll overcome that darkness with light. Amen. Now, your flesh may feel good just venting on someone and doing a flesh flash. I'm going to go off on you, and all my flesh feels so good. But after, what, after a little bit, your spirit goes, oh, man, you went against your nature of love. So now I'm going to have to repent and apologize. Save yourself the trouble. Don't write that text. Don't write that email right away. Go to pray about it. Put the flesh under. Sizzle, sizzle, sizzle. And then do something and ask the Holy Spirit, what do you want me to do? How do you want me to bless them practically? And he's going to give you something on practically something to do to actually reach them. That's the Spirit. Most Christians don't take that road. And they get the results that they have. And so today, the Lord's saying there's a better way. Make room for the wrath that was on the cross. You made room for your sins. Why did that a little bit? Realize their sin was put on Jesus too. Do good to them. Bless them because that's what the Father does to you. And God's able to turn that around and repay you. Some horrible things done to you. God is able to repay you. Better than you could ever do it. Let's bow our heads. Father, I thank you so much for your word. I thank you, Lord, that in, in strife with relationships, Lord, we have a tendency to focus on them. But today, Lord, we're asking, Lord, show us. We can't control them, but we can us. So, Lord, show us how we can change in the midst of this relationship. And then some of you has had injustice done to you. You've had horrible things done to you. And they're not right. They're wrong. And they owe you. But they can't pay you. And even if they could pay you, many of them won't, wouldn't. But they can't pay you the price done to you. But God can repay you. He can. Will you make room for the wrath? that was on the cross. Make a little bit more room than just your sins and you can make some room for theirs and assign that hurt and that pain to the cross and let the Lord repay you. He wants to. If that's you today, the Lord's speaking to you today, I want you to stand to your feet. Every eye closed, but I want you to stand today if God's speaking to you today. You can't bootleg this prayer takes humility. Stand to your feet. Father, these that are standing today admit that they've had injustice done to them, Father. And Lord, as they've made room for you to forgive them, they're going to widen the room that you have forgiven the sins of those and the, your, those sins of the people against them was put on Jesus. And that wrath was poured out and Jesus died. And so, Lord, I'm asking you to show, the, show each person standing what area in their life that they can, can change or accept or, or do what you called them to do, Lord. But I'm asking you right now, according to your word, repay them for what's been done to them. Repay them perfectly in an interest. Turn ashes to beauty. Do it, Jesus. Justice is yours. You will repay them. 
Father, I thank you for doing it right now. Angels are being released from the throne. Healing is taking place in hearts. Relationships coming into order. Doing what they could never do in a million years. Lord, show them how to overcome the darkness with light right now. We thank you for your goodness and grace. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's worship God together.
whom the sun sets free is free indeed. And I think it would be a shame if any of us left without that freedom today, amen? So I just encourage you, you know, whatever hardships or relational situations that pastors' messages stirred in your heart, you know, just give that to the Lord. And just say, Lord, I give it to you, God. Maybe, maybe I don't know all the details. Maybe I don't know what I should have done differently. But Lord, I, I walk into your freedom today. Whom the sun sets free is free indeed. I just want to encourage you that if any of you feel like you have a word of, of freedom for this house today, a word that you feel like is from the Lord's heart to this congregation, I encourage you. We've got our prophetic gatekeeper over here. We've got Brother Abraham by this exit door. And I would just encourage you, don't, don't walk out the door with somebody else's freedom. Amen. And freedom reigns in this place. Rivers of mercy and grace It's flowing here in this place There is freedom Jesus reigns. He reigns over every situation. Jesus reigns in this place Rivers of mercy and time, just the voices, and make this your prayer. Sing freedom reigns. Freedom reigns in this place. And rivers of mercy and grace. It's flowing here in this place. There is freedom.
Good morning. When we were praying this morning um, for everybody today, uh, the Lord had just shown me that uh, in Ephesians 5, it talks about that Christ is the head of the church. And then he began to show me that here in River Rock, you know, he's still the head. This is a smaller part of the full body, right? But that there's people here that he really does want you to step up with what he's putting on your heart, rather it's helps, rather it's whatever. That's what makes the church really walk in the fullness of what it needs to do. So if you're feeling of prompting, I feel like there's some that feel like, what, what can I do, or I'm not really that important. And I know I have felt that way too, so I understand that, but every single part of the body is so important. So I just encourage you, if you're feeling a, even a slight tug, plug in. That's how you're going to connect. You're going to be blessed in that, and God's going to bless your hand as well. The Bible says we love because He first loved us. And it's hard sometimes to love, but when we just abide in the mind, His love flows through. We're perfected in his love. There's no fear. We become more like Jesus every day. So let me sing this next chorus one more time. I just want us to think of what he's done and how much he loves us. There are no bad days when we're rooted in his love. Amen. He's so good.
is good, isn't he? And I just really would encourage all of us to take these words that we've heard to heart and, you know, what Joyce was just sharing with us and Miss Barbie too. And, you know, I just encourage you, you know, be set free. Be set free today. Like Greg Moore says, count the cross greater than your loss. Amen. Count the cross greater than any hurt, any problem, any pain, any situation, place, person, thing. It doesn't matter. You know, we were talking in first service a little bit that Joyce Meyer gave a great quote that's always stuck with me, and some of you have heard it, but, you know, she said that unforgiveness is like drinking a poison and hoping that the other person dies. But let's be set free from all that today, amen? He's worthy of it. And all the saints and angels, they bow. So I just felt like the Lord was saying, um, if you just want to lay your burdens down, lay your disappointment down, lay anything that is not of God, um, and just surrender fully to Him, lay your pride, whatever it is, um, I'm going to be up front here just laying it down, and if you want to come and join me, I encourage you to um, just make that um, act of faith um, and just things that you've been holding on to whether it's bitterness whether it's um, 
unforgiveness or whether it's just hopes that you were like, Lord, I thought this would happen by now and it's been affecting you. Um, I just encourage you to come and lay it down because you're so much more than that. You're worth so much more than those things, than those disappointments, um, than that unforgiveness. You're so worthy to be fully loved and fully free in him right now today. Amen. And so I just invite anyone who wants to come with me as we just praise God that he's worthy of it all. Amen. His sacrifice was not done in vain. Let's not take another step and let that sacrifice be in vain. And let's lay it all down and incur and enjoy the freedom of the cross. Amen. And the freedom of the resurrection of Jesus. So Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. And day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Oh, day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night, night and day, let incense arise. Day and night.
that's gone forth today. God, we receive it. And I thank you, Lord, that what you've done will not be shaken. It will not be removed in the name of Jesus. You are worthy of it all. For from you are all things. To you just for a moment before we wrap it up. Lift your hands up in the air. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. We've made room for the wrath at the cross and now made room for grace and mercy to flow into our lives like a river Thank you for your goodness, Lord. Thank you, Lord. You can be seated. We want to continue to honor the Lord with our tithes and our offerings. And as we have a few more minutes of worship, ushers, can you please pass out the offering envelopes as you're filling that out? Uh, We'll have a few more minutes of worship, and then I'll be back up to pray for the offering.
darkness, I called your name. From the darkness, I called your name. Into darkness, your mercy came. You called me out, lifted me up. How great is your love for my weakness. of heaven. From the heights of heaven, you step down to earth. Innocent perfection gave you life for us and we are amazed. Yes, we stand in awe for we have been changed by the power of the cross. How great is your love. Because on the night you were betrayed, you took bread and you had communion. When all of them were about to betray you, you made room for them at the cross. You could have said, I'm done with this. They can just be left to themselves. God, just burn it all up. I don't care. We'll start over. But the night he was betrayed, he made room for us at the cross. Thank you for your grace. Thank you everything that we have is by grace, unmerited favor. Lord, we have the opportunity right now in this offering to take a portion of the grace you've given us and consecrate it and sow it back into your kingdom by faith. And it'll go to work, a harvest of souls, deliverance, healing, but it'll work back into our lives a natural harvest of good measure, pressed down, shaken together, running over, a harvest of grace back into our lives so we can give again. Father, we thank you so much that everything sown in this offering is holy unto you, sealed in your kingdom, and now your blessing comes over all of our finances in the name of Jesus. Everybody agree with that? Amen. Let's release the rose from the back to the front. If you have an offering, you can put it in the offering box. Let's wait till everybody serve their communion elements. We'll protect together.
Let's sing, there has never been, there will never be. Because of that great love, we can celebrate, amen, that our joy may be full, praise God. And um, Luke 22 and verses, um, starting in verse 14, when the hour has come, he sat down and the 12 apostles with him. And then he said to them with fervent desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. Do you know how much longing the Lord has to dine with us, to be with us, to fellowship with us? A fervent desire, not just a desire, but like an extreme longing and desire to be with you and to take your burdens. Um, Amen. And so... Praise God. For those of you who came up front, I don't know if you experienced this, but I just began, like, the joy just began to well up in me. And I just felt lighter. And God is so good. And, and so anyways, he just, that's, that's his heart. He wants to do that for us every minute of every day. Right? Yes. And so in this moment... Let's do this. Let's take this in remembrance of him, but not only at church, not only when we take communion, but every step in life we take, do it in remembrance of God, not in remembrance of being wronged, not in remembrance of, you know, how, you know, stinky we can be (laughs) or whatever, right? But do it in remembrance of him and have our eyes and our focus be on him. Just like it says, um, In verse 17, then he took the cup and gave thanks and said, Take this and divide it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine until the kingdom of God comes. And we all know it is come, amen. And he took bread, gave thanks, and broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body which is given to you. Do this in remembrance of me. Likewise, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is said for you, or shed for you. Amen. So we have a better covenant with better promises. And every day when we take that step, I have a better covenant with better promises. I don't have to stay in the stank of the world. Amen. I don't have to stay there. I can move forward and I can do this. I can remember my Jesus. I can remember that I am accepted in his beloved when it feels like everybody else has rejected me, right? Amen? That's power right there. That's true love right there, unconditional love. 
And so as we do this, John's, and my husband John, he's going to pray, and we're just going to relish in that love and joy of God in remembering him. Amen. Amen. So, Lord, we thank you for your body that was broken for us. God, we thank you that you took on the burdens that we do not have to take anymore, the burdens of offense, unforgiveness, sickness, and sin, God. So, Lord, right now we just take your body in remembrance of what you did and the burdens that you took for us. And, Lord, thank you for your blood, the forgiveness of our sins. God, thank you that you do not pour your wrath out on us every time we screw up. And, Lord, we just make room in our lives right now to not release wrath on others, to not hold bitterness unforgiveness and offense against others. God, we thank you for the freedom that we're finding right now because you have forgiven us. In Jesus' name. Prayer ministers, you come at this time. If you don't know Jesus Christ, he died for you on the cross, shed his life blood out for you so you could have eternal life. You can never earn or deserve heaven. You can't be good enough for it. Jesus died for what you did wrong and make you right and take you to heaven. If you need Jesus today and you don't have him, you don't know 100% you're right with God, but you want to know at this time, prayer ministers, I want you to make your way right now up to one of our prayer ministers and pray with them. Are you filled with the Holy Spirit? Do you speak with tongues? Are you filled with the power of God as a gift for every child of God? Peter said this gift of the baptism of the Holy Spirit on the day of Pentecost is for you, your children, your children's children, and to as many as the Lord our God shall call. And that includes us. So if you don't have that gift, make your way up here right now to our prayer ministers. But let's, let's pray and end in prayer in our living room with our brothers and sisters. Let's pray together. And stay for, for a pleasant bread, pizza. I would cast the calories out of them, but these only come out by prayer and fasting. So let me pray over the meal, and then when, we, when, we finish, when I finish praying, I want you guys to get in the groups of five or six and pray for one another, bless one another, agree with one another. Father, I just thank you so much for what you've said today and what you've done today. We've heard from you today. And Lord, by your grace, we'll yield. And we thank you for changing our life by the power of God. Father, we thank you for the fellowship of the saints. And Father, I thank you for the food that we have today that is blessed and sanctified according to the word of God in prayer. And you take sickness from the midst of us and we're blessed by it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Gather up and pray with one another and then you're dismissed. God bless.